A warm welcome to you all to the Feminist Climate Action by One and All, Generation Equality, Human Rights and Climate Justice event. I'm Kavitha Naidu, an international human rights lawyer working in feminist climate justice, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. The video you just saw on climate action and women's leadership is an excellent introduction to the topics we will be discussing today, as it clearly communicates the importance of hearing the diverse voices of women and girls in the urgent fight against the climate crisis. This exciting webinar is organized by the UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific as part of the Global Generation Equality Campaign launched last month in Mexico to bring together governments, civil society and change makers from around the world to accelerate action on equality, leadership and opportunity for women and girls worldwide. Our webinar is organized with the contributions from our partners from civil society, the UN, and the Asian Development Bank. I am honored to introduce a group of remarkable speakers representing diverse stakeholders working on gender equality, feminist justice, and women's rights and climate action. I am certain we will all be enriched by the experiences and knowledge shared today to build our work together. We will spend the next two hours deep diving into these discussions. As you will see from the agenda, we will begin with opening remarks from Mr. Muhammad Nasiri, Ms. Khadija Nasim, and Ms. Viva Tatawanga, who I'll introduce shortly. This will be followed by a short video. You will see through the agenda we've interspersed with videos to create a different virtual experience. The second part will have three keynote addresses by Ms. Kekashan Basu, Mr. Saad Al-Faragi, and Ms. Kami Pros. Following the next video break, we will open the floor to our fireside chat with our four panelists, Ms. Chandani Joshi, Ms. Parimita Mohanty, Mr. Puji Pujiono, and Ms. Donibel Woods. This leads to a Q&A session followed by a Pecha Kucha celebration, something I too will experience for the first time. And this will be presented by four inspiring leaders, Dr. Bin Bin Wang, Ms. Pralisha Adhikari, Ms. Zimel Umer and Ms. Raya Nassim. We will close with a Slido where you get a chance to contribute your actions on how to move forward on climate action. Ms. Basu will conclude with how you can join the Action Coalition on Feminist Action to Climate Justice. And with the final video, we will be energized to continue our work in fighting for climate justice. So before I begin, I would like to go through a few housekeeping rules. As we are a large group today, all attendees except our designated speakers will be muted and cameras will be disabled to save bandwidth and ensure a smooth webinar experience. We are very eager to engage with you all and my colleagues Pan Pan will be your online moderator. We would like to encourage you to please use the Q&A function for any questions and the chat for any other comments. We will aim to address these questions throughout the program. The closed captions have been enabled for those who would prefer subtitles for this event. You may enable them in your Zoom settings in the bottom of your screen. We are also providing Chinese translation for the webinar today. And with this, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Mohammed Nasiri, the Regional Director of UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Mr. Nasiri has extensive experience in the region and in gender and development issues. He has served UN Women as the regional director in the Arab states and now here in Asia and the Pacific. Prior to joining UN Women, Mr. Naziri was the deputy country director of UNDP in Yemen. Also, he has worked in Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon and Cambodia on issues of human rights and gender. Mr. Naziri, I now invite you to the floor for your opening remarks. Thank you so much, Kavita. I go by Mohammed uh, without Mr. And uh, good morning and afternoon. And thank you all for making time for this important convening today. I um, particularly um, uh, wish to acknowledge the Honorable Deputy Minister of Environment from the Maldives, Ms. Khadija Nassim, who's with us today. Together uh, with the team, I wish to welcome you to the launch of a report on human rights and climate change prepared as a result of the successful collaboration between UN Women and the Stockholm Environment Institute. 
This virtual convening today will also provide us with an opportunity to learn more about the Generation Equality Forum, which is being co-convened by UN Women together with the governments of Mexico and France, which, as you rightly said, Kavita has kick-started last March in Mexico City and will be culminating in Paris in June. The forum aims to spur financial policy uh, and uh, other commitments for gender equality, fuel a diverse and powerful intergenerational movement of people and organizations, and drive widespread public attention and mobilization around the theme of gender equality. It will create a significant and lasting coalition of like-minded people passionate about gender equality. It presents us with a vital moment for activists, feminists, youth and allies to achieve transformative change for generations to come. More than 80 member states, private sector companies, and international civil society youth-led organizations have been actively engaged in shaping the forum's call to action by leading action coalitions on themes ranging from economic justice to strengthening feminist movement. This number of organizations is expected to expand significantly as the coalitions recruit new commitment makers in the run-up to the high event in Paris. This enduring multi-sector movement for action and accountability on gender equality will be a lasting legacy of the forum. Today, we will focus on the action coalition of feminist action to climate justice, which includes the leaders from the government of the Maldives. And we are very happy to have the Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister for Environment in the Maldives, Ms. Khadija Nassim. Diva for Equality, represented by Ms. Viva Tatawaka, Green Hope Foundation with Ms. Kehkashan Basu, UN Environment Program, who are partnering with UN Women on the Regional Empowered Project. Other leaders of the Action Coalitions include the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the United Nations Development Program, and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, in addition to International Fund for Agricultural Development and other organizations. I would also like to thank UNICEF for the support and work on Youth Climate Champions, which also is very much supporting generation equality. During this convening, we hope to learn more about the key priorities, which represent the blueprint for action for the next five years. These priorities cover a range of issues from increasing the direct access to financing for gender just climate solutions, and in particular, for women and girls at grassroots levels, to the production and use of data on gender environment nexus. Through this multi-stakeholder dialogue on the feminist climate action by one and all, we, accept, we expect to bring the global discussions to the regional level and identify areas of collaboration and cooperative action in our region. Thank you again for joining us today. And I really hope that we all have very engaging discussions. Thank you and back to you, Kavita. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for such an encouraging opening and for providing a broader context of what this event is all about. Our next speaker represents the leadership of the Action Coalition of Feminist Action for Climate Justice, the Honorable Ms. Khadija Nassim, Deputy Minister at the Minister, Minister, Ministry of Environment, Maldives. Ms. Nassim oversees the policies and work related to climate change and previously has worked on various development projects in the Maldives. She has extensive experience in climate finance and disaster risk management. Ms. Nassim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kavita. Good morning uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, warm greetings to you all on Earth Day. And um, first of all, let me thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to contribute to this important dialogue. And thank you, Mr. Nasiri, for your kind words just now. As we all know, uh, climate change demonstrates that the global commons is indivisible. The impacts of climate change will be felt planet-wide regardless of contribution. A common theme highlighted by small island developing states such as the Maldives 
is that we suffer the impacts of a problem we have no role in creating. While this inequity of disproportionate consumption of resources and unequal environmental impact is true, there's also another inequity that gets perpetuated because of this. This is inequity that arises from the politics of inclusion and exclusion from the practices and structures of environmental governance. Those who are most affected by the impacts of climate change have the least access to decision-making um, about environmental protection, sustainable development, and the use of resources. The reasons are manifold and lie in practices of marginalization, power asymmetries, as well as access to knowledge and influence. The environmental politics of gender demonstrate this double inequity. For women and indigenous peoples, the disproportionate impact of the causes and consequences of climate change are symptomatic of the biases of a more extensive structural inequality, unequal, unequal and inequitable allocation of resources to decision-making authority in both adaptation and mitigation compound the problem. And this is true even in the case of the Maldives. Women play an important role in driving the engine of economic growth and perform vital functions in agriculture, fisheries, marine and natural resource management. Yet, unfortunately, women's voices are often overlooked and undervalued in climate governance space. So the solution lies in more equitable and fair governance mechanisms, where those who are impacted the most also get the opportunity in the decision-making process. So we need greater and more thoughtful gender equal representation, both in the climate finance and decision-making processes to ensure that we address the current structural inequalities that are resulting in disproportionate access to natural and financial resources. Along with Costa Rica, the Maldives chose to call it the Coalition on Feminist Action for Climate Justice within the Generation Equality Forum, which aims to produce a list of focused and concrete actions that can deliver maximum results such as increasing direct access to finance for gender just climate solutions, and in, in particular for organizations led by women and girls at the grassroots and rural level. The impacts of climate change on livelihoods have been discussed far and wide. Enabling women to lead transition to sustainable green economies would prove one of the most important resilience building measures. Um, home gardening, food, food production, reviving sustainable handicrafts, and even ecotourism are fields where women could contribute towards a sustainable green economy. And the other key challenge is a significant absence of data and record keeping on gender and climate change and improved data collection and analysis would be a key priority action area. And in the Maldives, instruments such as the Green Climate Fund have incorporated gender considerations in the program. And likewise, the development of our strategic action plan of the government has been dealt with a strong focus on gender, where the policy priority of transition into a blue economy while combating climate change and enhancing climate resilience incorporates significant roles for women. And in addition, gender considerations are also factored in our ambitious nationally determined contributions, which aim to re reach net zero by 2030. And as far as the legal framework goes, the Gender Equality Act prohibits discrimination based on gender in all areas. And in addition with the lo recent local council elections held in the Maldives earlier this month, Women make up a third of the councils and this representation has been ensured through an amendment brought to our Decentralization Act. Um, as a result, access to decision-making process for women will be greatly improved and it is only a first step in paving the way for more women and girls to overcome the socioeconomic barriers that inhibit them from engaging in political, business and civic arena. So the positive impacts of enhancing participation of women in environmental decision-making processes have been demonstrable at the local, national, and uh, regional, and global level. And um, currently, there are limited funds and mechanisms that have operationalized these principles through established modalities to in order to strengthen and ensure that what is proposed is practiced. We propose that gender considerations can be factored in monitoring and reviewing of ongoing projects. And likewise, priority should be attached uh, to giving women and school leaving girls skills and access to employment in green, blue, and blue jobs through STEM. Going forward, uh, it is important that local experiences are taken into account while implementing projects. This includes having constant dialogues with women and other community members at the grassroots level. Likewise, we also need to double up on our advocacy for increasing access to climate finance and ensuring that such financial resources are 
utilized to address the needs of women and other marginal groups in the community. Uh, we also believe that greater care should be devoted to practices such as uh, proposal writings for projects, as well as reporting mechanisms to ensure that the voices are heard and the concerns are addressed. And finally, education and training programs targeting women and other marginal groups and all aspects of climate change should be considered a priority. To conclude, uh, women's empowerment and participation is essential in achieving the transformative changes necessary to move, to move towards a greener, just, and prosperous uh, future. Thank you so much. Ms. Nassim, thank you for your excellent insights into the disproportionate impact of the climate crisis on women and girls, particularly from this region. Um, we thank you again for your leadership on this issue, underscoring the efforts of um, Maldives, and in particular, the inclusion of women into decision-making spaces. That was a very positive thing to hear. Um, I will now turn to our next speaker, who is Miss Viva Tatawanga. Um, she is a management collective member of Diverse Voices and Action for Equality, Diva for Equality from Fiji, Ms. Tatawanga is a young Pacific feminist grassroots community facilitator and mobilizer and works on many initiatives at the local, national, regional and global levels on human rights, social, economic, ecological and climate justice. Diva for Equality undertakes grassroots feminist work and co-convenes several networks and coalitions from local to global, including Women Defend Commons Network, and the Pacific Feminist Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights Coalition. Ms. Tatawanga, please take the floor. Thank you, Kavita. And it's so nice to, it's so good to see you. It's good to you see too. Faces on the panel. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And um, this afternoon, I will be talking briefly about our engagement in the feminist action, uh, climate justice, and why is that important to form such a coalition? Um, I think from a perspective, thank you to Mr. Mohammed and Mr. Ms. Kajit for sharing their thoughts on the issue. Feminists working on climate justice know how crucial this, um, how crucial and why is it important? Why everybody's involvement is uh, important and why is it needed? Government must change, society must change in all areas. That is not just about changing your everyday individual living, but how as much as that is important, it's also important that we not we recognize addressing inequalities in the heart of family's climate change work and addressing inequalities in unfair of rich and poor people in the world, because that comes out, that brings out conversation around addressing inequalities at the looking at the deeper realities at the heart, uh, what makes our world unfair in so, to so many. We landed in this bad place globally because of our unfair systems. We need to work to change those systems as the core of climate change. As feminists, we don't just look at this as one issue alone, but an interlinkage of issue of ecology, environment, development, and social justice. Uh, climate change is a symptom of deeper problems of human action and bad system. Therefore, we need to work together. We need to come to a proper um, conversation platform where we can have this kind of uh, very um, assertive conversation, like Mr. Kajit was talking about the climate finance and Mr. Mohammed was referring to the importance of everybody getting recognized and given a chance to uh, participate in this conversation. It's also an intersectional issue because the ways that issues of climate change, all, um, all justice uh, experience depend on who we are and all our intersecting identities, where we live and where we're our privileges, our, our oppressors face because of them and our relationship with other people, other species and effects of the living planet. It's also an intergenerational issues, a violation against children and young people. At this rate, they will not have a healthy environment to live in when they grow up as a generation and also a generation after this. We are already suffering loss and damage. So that is their future likely. We have to ask ourselves, what is the future likely to be for our future generation? That is why young people and leaders in climate justice work and through grassroots networks like Ganga, uh, Women Defend the Commons and other grassroots networks that uh, 
we are trying to change that, to provide ourselves with the tools to fight back and to change futures to climate just and sustainable for all. And how, uh, why, why is DIVA involved? Just like other partners that comes uh, with specific constituency analysis about climate justice and the work we're all doing around the issue. DIVA also bring a whole set of knowledge, experience and skills on the table for further work that needs to be done. We work broadly with diverse grassroots women such as LBTI women, women in rural and maritime areas, women from informal settlement areas, single moms, widows, sex workers, with women with disabilities, women's market vendors, fisheries and, and so forth. And therefore, experience, they are also experienced doing this work for the past 10 years now is that all this group of women and gender non-binary people experience of the losses, damage and resources to climate injustice, continually natural disaster in many unjust development issues in their areas of work and living. And this must be taken into account in all our work. Diva's involvement in is important because we bring out the importance of having the conversation around intersectionality to ensure that we are covering everyone when we are talking about uh, strategies and better engagement in the area of climate justice. By 2030, we're talking um, about strategies and better engagement and we're talking about achieving uh, the 17 SDG goals. We have to achieve Paris Agreement targets. We have the a minimum in with specific focus of goal 13 in climate action. That is youth, but never enough for families. We realize all goals are linked and all are necessary achieve. Development justice that is um, ecologically sound and climate just leaving no one behind. We need to practice on that and how we're really doing that in the work that we are all doing. How are we doing that in the work that we're doing? We ensure that last two years we built 16 homes, Cyclone 5 proven houses, that is through partnership with Fiji uh, Habitat and APTC. More of those kind of engagement needs to be collated. But also in the past years during COVID breakdown, what we did was we sent out almost 200 sets of um, dispensary for health nurses, for village nurses, and also for uh, SRHR paid for young women. So at some point we think like we play different parts on the work, on this work in fighting and ensuring that we are balancing the work on climate justice. We don't recognize the, all the importance of all the work that we're doing, the front line, the middle and the back lines. Some of us are out there on the street that needs to be recognized while some of us are here trying to change policies and legislation. All this work is important. And part of what DIVA work is really about now is we have to make sure that the material and the structural changes that we are all trying to do come to a balance because Nevertheless, they will need each other. As much as we're doing the work on the ground, we also need to be pushing the works on the legislation, on the policy and stuff. And how do we then come together? That is the kind of question that we bring into this kind of space. And we are thankful that we have this kind of space that we can really uh, have some assertive conversation and some constructive conversation in building better. And just to close up for, so I take. I hope I'm not overtaking time, Kavita. You can conclude. Action. Yeah. Action. Having this regional event, while it will advance the platform where we can keep sharing such work, grassroots communities already championing in the area of work and make proper linkages between local and global and back. This means all sorts of work in all kinds of places, not just in local spaces and processes, but changing in the way we think and act and democracy, human rights, development, justice, etc. Action, Action Coalition of Feminist Actions for Climate Justice role of DIVA is important because it's never easy to create a balanced platform where all work is recognized national, regional, and globally, including women in the economic South, small island societies, and others. But giving in an attempt with clear political visions, resourcing, and work, and underpinning it with framing with strong feminist analytical arguments, 
creates a sense of hope for a better future for all. This is then about real release, resist, re resilience, about resistance to the extent of better economic systems. And repairing our forests, coral reefs, building societies that recognize unpaid care in domestic work of women. We are not just dreaming just futures, just making it happen. And while it is difficult, it is urgent and necessary work. Thank you. Thank you so much, my sister Viva from Fiji. That was very powerful. And, you know, keep fighting, keep fighting hard so that we have these voices, the grassroots voices in the spaces where it belongs to effect the change that we're demanding. Now, I would like us to enjoy two minutes of a recently launched video produced by UNEP under the Empower, Empower Project titled The Letters. That was a beautiful video showing how women's leadership and women's innovation can amplify climate action for a better future. So we now move on to the next part of our event today. And this has our keynote addresses. We will have three speeches on gender equality, human rights and climate justice. These will unpack some of the areas of concerns and present the work of the Action Coalition. We do not have a dedicated Q&A session here, but I would encourage you all to write your questions in the Q&A. If time permits, we will take some questions live, but if we're running short, um, the speakers, except Mr. Alparagi, uh, who will deliver a recorded video message, can answer in writing after they have finished presenting. So with this, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, iconic youth leader, global influencer, environmentalist, champion of children's rights and a passionate advocate for women's rights, Ms. Kekeshan Basu. She is a trailblazer who has been challenging the status quo and breaking social structures and taboos which impede the progress and rights of future generations. Ms. Basu is the founder president of the Social Innovation Enterprise Green Hope Foundation, which provides young people in 25 countries a networking platform to engage in the sustainable development process and take actions to mitigate climate change. She is also a youth leader of the Action Coalition. Ms. Pasu, please take it away. Thank you, Kavita, and hello everyone. And happy birthday. Um, as was just said, my name is Kehkesha. I am one of the youth leaders of the Action Coalition on Feminist Action for Climate Justice as part of the Generation Equality Forum. And I'm also a United Nations human rights champion and founder president 
of Green Hope Foundation, which, as was also mentioned, is a global social innovation enterprise across 25 countries that's directly empowered over 140,000 people using education for sustainable development to engage those who are the farthest first, who most of the time are women and girls from vulnerable populations. We work on climate justice, focusing on the linkages of gender and climate, while concurrently implementing processes to build climate resilience, identifying and implementing adaptation and mitigation actions, as well as gender responsive approaches to climate justice. So that is why we feel so at home in this action coalition amongst the public and private stakeholders, global organizations and institutions led by women and girls in all our diversity who've dedicated their lives towards ensuring feminist action for climate justice. Now, it's a well-known fact that climate change is one of the greatest existential crises of our time with a disproportionate impact on women and girls, especially those in vulnerable and marginalized communities. It's an inequality multiplier. And in the past 12 months, we have witnessed how COVID-19 has exacerbated these negative impacts, pushing many of the already disenfranchised women and girls further into the mire of poverty, abuse, exploitation, and deprivation. At the same time, the burden of rebuilding a community, including and especially after a climate change induced disaster, falls upon the same women and girls who are victimized by their circumstances and in turn have their natural leadership roles in feminist actions for climate justice ignored in favor of continuing with business as usual, which of course isn't gender just. And furthermore, climate change has different impacts on different parts of the world. Thus, women and girls in all of our diversity bring unique experiences to the table that must be acknowledged and recognized. Now, uh, next slide, please. The Action Coalition on Feminist Action for Climate Justice exemplifies the importance of uh, intersectional, game-changing, scalable, transformative, and measurable commitments and targets that address the needs of the most vulnerable and recognizes the critical role of feminist action on climate justice emanating from the grassroots level. And this is exactly what is reflected by the four action areas of this blueprint. And this is why they've been chosen, because they address the unique challenges of women and girls in their full diversity globally, paving the way by 2026 for climate smart, gender just circular bioeconomies, increased resilience of women and girls to climate change induced disasters, defending their human rights, creating safe spaces and enhancing the meaningful engagement of women and girls as leaders at all levels of decision making. Next slide, please. The first action area is to increase direct access to financing for gender just climate solutions, in particular for women and girls at grassroots levels. Now, currently, women and girls as environmental activism receives only a paltry 3% of philanthropic environmental funding, which puts a huge strain and restricts the actions that can be undertaken by women and girls in their own zones of influence. And this action area thus calls for a revamp of financing mechanisms and seeks to increase by 2026 the percentage of global climate finance flows, uh, public and private, directed towards and invested in gender just climate solutions with a specific focus at the grassroots and rural levels including through an increase to 65% in the proportion of marked climate bilateral and multilateral finance targeted towards gender. And most importantly, it calls for effective monitoring and to conduct assessments of whether and how targeted financing is reducing gender gaps in access to and ownership of natural resources. Next slide, please. The second action area, calls for enabling women and girls to lead a just transition to a green economy. 
Improving service delivery is a critical component of this action area to tackle discriminatory gender norms and barriers that prevent women and girls' participation and leadership for climate justice through new and improved laws and policies, education and capacity building, and by changing the norms of engagement. And this would include investment in knowledge hubs and digital platforms globally, which are so relevant now, in particular for grassroots indigenous women, ensuring increased access to all levels and types of educational tools, including STEM learning and garnering private sector commitments to integrate gender considerations into their green transition plans. And through these initiatives, the goal is to increase the proportion of women and girls in decision-making and leadership positions throughout environmental governance and sectors relevant for transitioning to an inclusive, circular, and regenerative green economy by 2026. Next slide, please. The third action area is to build the resilience of women and girls to climate impacts, disaster risks, loss and damage, including through land rights and tenure security by strengthening legal and policy frameworks, investing in gender just cooperative models, raising awareness of applicable financing initiatives and scaling up gender just solutions. And through this action, the objective is to leverage, strengthen and scale up the ability of women and girls in all their diversity to achieve resource independence and influence climate and environment policy planning at all levels. Next slide, please. The fourth and final action area is to increase the collection and the use of data on the gender environment nexus. This has been one of the largest gaps that has impeded gender equality on all fronts now, as the saying goes, what gets measured gets done. And the reverse holds true as well. And we have seen how data gaps tend to hide the stark realities of climate injustice, of women and girls' as exploitation. And consequently, policies and actions are ineffective since they do not address the root causes. Data and accountability go hand in hand with uh, action area four, and this area specifically calls for mechanisms that increase data production on the gender environment nexus through enhanced financial and technical support, and then use them for taking informed decisions on gender responsive policies that are time bound, milestone based and with concrete outcomes. And by 2026, the target is to have at least 19 countries that demonstrate incre increased policy uses of gender environment nexus and statistics by creating an enabling environment for an increased production of gender environment statistics. Next slide, please. Now, these action areas and their target date also fit in very well with the progress of the SDGs and Agenda 2030, and they enhance the progress of several targets and indicators within SDGs 5, 12, 13, and 17. Now, this is not to say that they don't address the other SDGs and targets, though, because with the intersectionality of the work being done across the globe, the feminist actions on climate justice are able to touch upon each one of the SDGs in at least one region or the other. And this interconnectedness and synchronicity of the feminist action for climate justice blueprint with Agenda 2030 is of particular importance, especially during these trying times. And since they actually marked the beginning of the last decade of action to leave no one behind and ensure a life of dignity for all following the mandate of the SDGs. Next slide, please. Now, given the wide range of gender issues and inequalities that are impacted, climate justice efforts need to challenge the stereotypes that limit opportunities for girls and women. Through this action coalition, we're working to herald in a new normal that changes the narrative that portrays women and girls as victims. Instead, we get empowered to take our rightful place as leaders and decision makers who chart our own course with dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kekashan. That was such a useful and clear way of putting out what the action areas are under the coalition. Um, and really integrating how SDGs play a central role in forming those actions and where we can go from here. Um, I'm just trying to find if there is a question. Um, and yes, there is one. So this, this question is for you. Um, 
what could be done more from this multi-stakeholder network we are forming now to enhance the work of youth and gender non-binary groups on climate change? That's a really important question. And once again, I would like to emphasize the importance of uh, the grassroots actions. And I think that for young people, uh, who are gender non-conforming and girls and women at the grassroots level, that is a wonderful way to engage both in the action coalitions, which I'll talk about later in the conclusion, but also just to be involved in the process of climate justice. And I think it has to begin from there. And that is exactly what we uh, speak about and propagate in our action coalition, that it has to begin from the ground. And uh, my fellow youth organizations as well are all about the ground level actions and really driving the change from the bottom up. So there is a lot of opportunity there. And if there isn't as yet, make your own opportunity and just go for it. Great, thanks Kekashan. Um, we'll now move to um, our second keynote speaker, who is Mr. Saad Al-Faragi, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Development. Mr. Al-Faragi was appointed Special Rapporteur for the Right to Development in 2017. In 2019, Mr. Al-Faragi presented the thematic report to the UN Human Rights Council on the explicit link between the right to development and disaster risk reduction, with special attention to the gender dimension, considering the specific challenges related to disaster risk reduction that women and girls face. The report also concludes with key recommendations aimed at improving the participatory processes related to the planning, monitoring, and implementation of disaster risk reduction measures and policy. Mr. al Faragi is now drafting the thematic report on climate change related policies and projects from a right to development perspective. He is unable to join us today live because of the time difference, but please Pan Pan, if you could play his video recorded message, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to participate in today's event in my capacity as United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to development. I regret not being able to be with you in person. I'm glad that this forum will be looking at the specific effects climate change has on women's rights. Climate change is a global human rights threat multiplier which already impacts and will increasingly affect directly and indirectly a wide range of internationally guaranteed human rights, including in particular all people's enjoyment of their right to development. A natural or human-made disaster can undo years of development progress in a matter of hours and can stall future development for the next generation. The number of disaster events per year has been increasing since the 1980s and is likely to continue to do so as a result of climate change, population growth, urbanization, an increase in the number of people living in coastal areas and floodplains, and the degradation of loss or loss of natural ecosystems. Data show that developing countries in the global south are disproportionately affected by disasters. The majority of the countries most exposed to natural hazards and climate extremes are, are located in South Asia and Africa. In low and middle income countries where the growth of informal settlements is booming and poor families live in hazard prone areas with deficient or no infrastructure, a lack of social protection and high levels of environmental degradation exist. If we look at the 2020 World Risk Report, we can see evident that in Southeast Asia, a number of countries at high, are at high risk because they are both at highly exposed to disasters and are highly vulnerable. See page 50 of the report. Five Asian countries are listed in the highest risk category. Brunei Dar es Salaam, Philippines, Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Timor-Leste. And two countries, this Afghan, Yemen and Afghanistan, are listed among the most vulnerable. In addition, as illustrated so well in the report provided by the organizers of today's event, climate change, gender equality, and the human rights in Asia, climate change leads to additional challenges for women, exacerbating existing discrimination and poverty, while climate action does not provide them 
with adequate solutions or even with the opportunity to participate in decision making on equal basis. On this background, building resilience in particular for vulnerable countries and populations is of paramount importance. In 2019, I presented to the UN General Assembly a report which explored the explicit link between the right to development and disaster risk reduction and its practical implications. In that report, I noted that women are particularly vulnerable to the harmful impacts of disaster and that compounding this disproportionate impact is the fact that women are not included or not sufficiently included in disaster preparedness efforts. In the context of disasters, being left behind often amounts to the difference between life and death. Wide stakeholder participation is pivotal for developing resilience in practice. In paragraph 32 of the Sandai framework, it is stated that empowering women to publicly lead and promote gender equitable and universally accessible response, recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction approach is vital. In paragraph 36a, small i of the framework, it is recognized that women and their participation are critical to effectively managing disaster risk and designing, resourcing, and implementing gender-sensitive disaster risk reduction policies, plans and programs, and that adequate capacity building measures need to be taken in order to empower women for preparedness and build their capacity to secure alternate means of livelihoods in post-disaster situations. However, the implementation of these principles appears to be sporadic and inconsistent in many countries. In my report, I reviewed a number of existing measures in a variety of countries and settings, and I issued the following recommendations. In order to integrate the right to development into disaster risk reduction efforts, and more generally ensure human rights compliance, governments should promote channels of participation at all stages of the planning, implementation, evaluation, and monitoring of the related policies and programs on a continuous basis for all relevant stakeholders. There should be opportunities for the equal participation in all relevant planning and decision-making process of those who are most disadvantaged, including women with disabilities, girls and young women, minority women, indigenous women, and members of other disempowered and marginalized groups. In order to ensure gender equal and universally accessible response, recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction approach to disaster risk governance, states must ensure the equal participation of women in decision-making, monitoring, and evaluation at the national and local levels. A gender-sensitive approach should be systematically integrated into evaluation process. States must ensure the proportional representation of women in decision-making process at all levels, including in community-based disaster risk reduction activities. As part of their gender-oriented planning, states should take into consideration the fact that women are not a uniform group, and they should therefore pay particular attention to women facing multiple or intersecting forms of discrimination who may be harder to reach, including rural women living in remote areas, women with disabilities, migrant women, women for in, from indigenous or minority groups who do not receive information in language that they understand. Adequate resources should be budgeted for this purpose. I also wanted to inform you that this year, I will be devoting my thematic reports specifically to the subject of climate change and human rights from the right to develop perspective in the context of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the 2030 Agenda, and more on the core international human rights treaties. I'm collecting information regarding climate action policies that are in line with both the right to development and other commitments made under international environmental governments, as well as information about challenges and areas for improvement. On my website, 
you can find a more detailed information. The reports will be made public in August, September 2021, this year, and presented to the Human Rights Council at its 48th session and to the UN General Assembly at its 76th session. Thank you for your kind attention and wish you success in your deliberation. Thank you. Our thanks to Mr. Al Faragri for the very important message. And I do encourage those of us, particularly from the civil society working in feminist climate justice, to, to contribute to the submissions that he's collecting for his report that's going to be published later this year. SR reports carry immense weight in terms of the accountability in the work that we're trying to do on the ground. Um, the third uh, and final keynote speaker is Ms. Kami Pras. I'm really happy to introduce her. She is a research associate from Stockholm Environment Institute, SEI, to officially launch and present the UN report that SEI, under the Empower Project, um, the Empower Project is a joint program with UN Women and UNF funded by the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. The report is titled Climate Change, Gender Equality and Human Rights in Asia, Regional Review and Promises, Promising Practices. It synthesizes evidence from, dif from 10 different sectors, agriculture and forestry, fisheries, mining, construction, energy, Manufacturing, wholesale and retail, trade, tourism, education and health. My, my, that's a lot of areas that is being covered in this report, which is why I think it's going to prove extremely useful as a resource tool for most of us to use for the realities of what is happening in this region. With this, Kami, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kavita. Um, so, yeah, my name is Camille Pras, I'm, and I'm a research associate at the Stockholm Environment Institute based in Bangkok. Um, and last year, with my colleagues, uh, we wrote this report entitled Climate Change, Gender Equality, and Human Rights in Asia. And today, I'm very happy to present the results of this report, and I'll try to align it with the priorities of the Feminist Action for Climate Justice. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide, yeah, thank you. Um, so, as Kavita mentioned, we uh, conducted a review of scientific evidence of the impact of climate change on human rights and gender in 10 sectors of the economy. And what we found is a bit unsurprising, unfortunately, it's that uh, human rights and, and uh, human rights issues and gender inequalities increase with climate change. And more importantly, uh, it's that people who were already uh, suffering from human rights violation and gender inequalities, these people are the most affected by climate change. Um, next slide, please. Um, so previous speakers already gave examples of how um, human rights and gender, inequ uh, gender inequalities increase with climate change. So I'd like to focus a bit on the methodology that we used for this report. Um, usually uh, human rights and gender equality are considered as two separate issues, two separate components or program areas. Uh, but this is um, actually an issue because uh, gender inequality are human rights violations and should be recognized as such. So for this report, we developed an approach that we called an intersectional human rights-based approach. Uh, so you can see on the left side, the three components of this human rights-based approach and on the right side, um, what we, uh, the intersectional uh, approach that we use to mainstream into this component of uh, the human rights approach. So we looked at how um, identities, socially constructed identities and statuses based on gender, class, location, race, and so on, intersect and create uh, dynamic power relationships that uh, can result in discriminations, human rights violation, marginalization, and also privilege for some groups in some specific contexts. So this allows to have a better understanding of how these dynamic um, interplay in different contexts, in different sectors of the economy, in different countries in the region. And we use this to uh, analyze um, how human rights framework and commitments are um, affected and implemented differently to, to reach these different people with different uh, identities. So the substantive rights element looks at the universally adopted standards in terms of human rights, such as the right to food, to shelter, to livelihood, and so on, which means that states have a, an obligation to implement them. 
And uh, these commitments are implemented through governance systems um, and uh, which need accountability and transparency and clear responsibilities between duty bearers. Uh, it can be the state, it can be the private sector, different uh, stakeholders involved in implementing, um, in ensuring human rights and gender equality. Um, we also looked at access to justice uh, when there are human rights violations, how people can uh, raise their concerns and uh, access remedies. And the last element is about the procedural rights, uh, where we looked at um, systems of or, or structures on how people can actually be consulted, how they're represented, and if they're allowed to meaningfully influence the decision when it comes to initiatives and projects that impact their environment or um, that are supposed to be um, positive for their communities, but if they're not consulted, um, these projects may actually have negative effects. So we use this approach to um, analyze the data we collected um, in the like, scientific papers, but we also used it to select um, promising practices and case studies. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the case studies we selected um, is actually one of my favorites because I think it really crystallizes all components of the human rights based approach and the, and the, the, the gender transformative um, element that we really want to emphasize um, in climate action. So it's a women led renewable energy initiative in rural Bangladesh. Um, and this initiative was implemented by a consultancy firm that is led by women and specializing in just transition. Um, and it's targeted illiterate women in rural Bangladesh and train them to assemble solar, uh, the components of solar panels and to market their products. Um, women were organized in uh, women-led cooperatives. They decided themselves how they want to market the products, who to reach, how to do so. So there was a strong focus on women's participation and leadership. Um, so women were considered as energy providers, but they also benefited from uh, electrification, which improved their health, their security, their livelihoods, so overall, a very positive impact on their human rights and those of the community um, in itself. And more importantly, and I think that's the most interesting part of this example, is that it had really transformative effects in the community on the long term. Uh, so as I mentioned, the women in this program were illiterate in the beginning, um, but it inspired a lot of, uh, it inspired them to enroll their daughters uh, into schools as the enrollment rates really increased during and after the project for young girls. And also many young women um, decided to study electrical engineering following the steps of uh, these women, which is usually a very male dominated field. And this example shows that a women led, um, a, a women -led initiative, even in rural Bangladesh, like in the, not, not if, it doesn't have to be like in a, in a very established governance structure, structure, but it can be very grassroots and you can see transformative change um, when it comes to leadership towards the green economy. Um, next slide, please. And the second, the second example I'd like to mention is about community-based ecotourism in Cambodia. So in the review of scientific evidence we did, we did on the sector of tourism, we saw that often um, tourism has negative impacts on the environment. It does not necessarily benefit local communities. But with this example, we saw some promising practices that I, that I thought it would be good to highlight. Um, so uh, one of the Cambodian uh, NGOs that we interviewed uh, really placed a strong emphasis on securing land tenure and users' rights of local communities, um, of ensuring the free, prior and informed consent uh, before any initiative would take place in their community. And this allowed the people from, from the village and from the, from the region to share the local conservation practices to keep um, practicing their knowledge and sharing their experience, which had positive impacts on the environment and also allowed them to share this knowledge with tourists. And also uh, the revenues generated by these activities were reinvested in the community. And there were the priority areas to uh, invest this money were decided by committees representing all people involved uh, in, the, in the initiative. And even though in the beginning, uh, many women were a bit shy or had other commitments due to their uh, care and domestic work and couldn't participate in those committees. And the NGOs we interviewed uh, told us that more and more women actually got involved in these communities and these committees. So together they decided how to invest the revenues and um, the priority they decided was to invest in uh, local infrastructures such as school or uh, bridges but also to support women's organization and self-help groups, or even to invest in more climate resilient um, agricultural practices. 
So overall, this example really improved the community resilience. Uh, they had control over the resources and natural resources, but also financial resources. And it helped them to be more resilient to the impacts of climate change, to share the, their traditional knowledge, and also to improve um, gender relations in the community. Uh, next slide, please. So to conclude, um, we can say that an intersectional human rights-based approach can enable transformative and more effective climate action. So you may have noticed that the examples I provided um, are aligned with the priorities of the feminist action for climate justice, uh, especially action one to, uh, to three with like equal access to resources, leadership of the marginalized and community ownership. Um, however, and as Kekesha noted uh, already before, uh, one critical gap uh, is when it comes to data on the gender and environment nexus. So for this report, um, we reviewed a lot of scientific evidence, a lot of, uh, a lot of data, and we found quite some information about women and climate change, but it was really difficult to find um, enough information on the impact of climate change on people with various uh, sexual orientation, gender identity expression, and sex characteristics. Um, this means that we really need to um, focus on collecting and using more data, not only statistics, but also qualitative, um, qualitative research to understand how climate change impacts these groups, to then be able to design more, um, more uh, inclusive and also more transformative climate action that actually reaches everyone, has positive effects on the society and on the, on the environment. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Back to you, Kimi. Kimi, thank you so much for your incredible work in putting this report together. It is so encouraging to see positive examples coming from countries in our region and really looking forward to unpacking those policy recommendations that have come from this report. Um, we do have a question for you. Um, over the years, the number of female researchers have increased tremendously with important topics being covered. How effective are the translation of science and research data to ground action? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> um, how effective? Well, it depends on, on who this data is targeted to. So at SCI, we do research to influence policy. So we work a lot with governments, with uh, NGOs, uh, and with uh, UN agencies, and we try to we try to collect uh, scientific data and to put it in a format that really um, that is really useful for our audience and for the people who are um, who are asking for this kind of report. Um, so it's always a bit frustrating to see that you give so many recommendations and and that it's um, a bit difficult to implement them on the ground. But you can see some results and you can see you can see many examples of of how, for example, just looking at how gender um, gender issues, gender mainstreaming is becoming more and more. Uh, recognized in the development scene, especially in the climate change uh, field, I think I think there is there are reasons to be optimistic and to be to be proud of the work we achieved and to look forward to more research informing development practices. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you so much, Cami. Um, so, before moving on, let's have a look at another video where we will look at how Tasin a UNICEF climate champion from Bangladesh, builds a greener future through cycling, planting trees, cleanups, and journalism. Um, while enjoying the video, perhaps some of you may like to take a little stretch to energize before we move to the, ne the next session on Q&A. The place where I am standing right now will disappear very soon. The people of this area are direct victim of climate change. Hello. My name is Tahsin. I am 22 years old from Bangladesh. Today I am going to show you my daily life and some of my social activities. Bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable countries towards global impact of climate change. I became interested in this subject thinking about the future of my country. In 2010, when I was 12, I started to publish a monthly magazine called Lal Shubud. There, children and teenagers of different ages started sending their problems and possibilities in the form of report. In 2013, I won the MENA Media Award from UNICEF for my role in child journalism, which gave me a lot of inspiration. Now, I am creating opportunities to practice journalism for children, those at risk of coastal climate. In this way, they are being able to present their situation directly to the world. 
In 2015, I established a youth organization called Lal Shabu Society. We have been working across the country on climate change, protection of children and women, mental health, soft skill development, etc. We clean up various public places, canals, tourist spots, on in a week. We also regularly collect unused plastics from our own and our friends' homes. After putting them all together, we sell them at recycling centers. The money get from here we spend on planting trees. As a part of this beautiful planet, it's my duty to keep it safe and sound. This tree I am planting today will save our climate soon. As a eco-friendly vehicle, I am promoting cycling in my country through our organization. Not only good for health, cycling cuts down on greenhouse gas emissions and global climate change. It reduces air and noise pollution and it's very beneficial for our mental and physical health. Due to COVID-19, we all are going through a difficult time. After the pandemic has spread in my country, I have been trying to stay at home as much as possible. But I have to work outside because I feel responsible for my society. I have been distributing food among the needy people, creating awareness, following the safety measures and hygiene. Due to corona crisis, I am doing many kinds of skill development sessions in online, currently facilitating mental health youth advocate training program. I am also doing my university classes virtually. In my laser period, I love reading books and I am also interested in graphic designing and filmmaking. The role of youth is most important for the present and future world. To protect the climate, you have to come forward now. I would say to all young people, start taking action from your place right now. It's our time. How incredible is Tassim? He started at 12 and it doesn't look like he's stopping anytime soon and just expanding on his skill set and doing amazing work um, as a youth champion. Now we will move to our Q&A where we will hear from four distinguished speakers um, and their take on the different action areas of the blueprint. Um, our team will post these action areas in the chat for your reference. And the objective of this panel is to move from identifying the challenges and areas of concern to exploring opportunities to advance collaboration and progress. Um, again, a kind reminder to all participants to please send your questions um, and to whom you're directing the question to um, using the Q&A function. Um, I would also like to encourage you to note down any thoughts on individual and institutional level actions that you would like to see us all doing. Um, as a very last agenda item, we will have an interactive session through Slido where you have the opportunity to share your thoughts on what we can all do as take home messages. Um, and so in this session, I'll ask our um, speakers to introduce themselves. Um, so we'll start with Ms. Chandani Joshi, please. Hi, I'm Chandani Joshi. I have worked for women's empowerment and gender justice for over 54 years of my life. 26 years with the government of Nepal as the chief of women development programs for several years and 18 years with UNIFEM as the regional director of South Asia, covering nine countries. Uh, after I retired in 2008, I have been uh, busier than ever fulfilling my role as enforcer of Homeless South Asia, chair of Women Friendly Disaster Management Group, and several of the reputed institutions and networks I'm advisor to. More power to you, Chandani. Um, for our next speaker, Ms. Um, Parimita Mohanty, please. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Parimita Mohanty. I'm working as Program Management Officer in United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, in Asia-Pacific Office at Bangkok. Um, I basically work on energy and climate change sector, and I have 18 years of experience on working on energy uh, sector. 
I basically work on thematically. I work on renewable energy, energy efficiency, smart grids, micro grids, um, and and other climate mitigation related activities. But I also work on women empowerment through renewable energy uh, and for sustainable development. Um, and and uh, empower project. We have already heard about that. Uh, from your next side, I'm working um, for basically leading the renewable energy activities within the Empower project. Um, and, and, and of course, we will hear more from that. Maybe I, I'll stop here and we can have more discussions uh, subsequently. Thank you. Thank you, Paramita. Very exciting to get a women's voice in the energy sector coming through from you. Um, our third speaker, Mr. Fuji Fujiono, please. Thank you, Ravita. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Puji Pujiono. I'm a living proof that there is indeed life after the UN. After working with the UN for about, 10, <laughs> for about 25 years, I returned to Indonesia. Uh, now I am um, a chairperson for the National Task Force on Disaster and Environmental Statistics. Uh, at the same time, I'm a senior advisor for SCAP for the same subject and also a member of the expert group at the global level for this emerging discipline. Now, in my free time, I organize uh, NGOs and civil societies and uh, in Indonesia, only two weeks ago, we declared uh, a national alliance of development and humanitarian uh, CSOs and NGOs with about around 6,000 organizations. I'm a social worker by training um, and uh, been in the UN with UNDP, UN OCHA uh, at headquarters and in the field. I'm pleased to be here. Congratulations, um, Fuji. <laughs> 6,000 organizations, my goodness. <laughs> What a feat. Well done. And our final um, panelist is Miss Zanibel Woods, please. Yes, hello, good morning. Um, it's uh, great to be here. Um, yes, my name is Zoni and I'm a senior gender specialist with the uh, Asian Development Bank based in, in Manila. Um, I have uh, about 30 years of experience working uh, first uh, in the environment uh, field and then uh, in the feminist women's rights uh, movement. Um, I've worked uh, with uh, the International Women's Health Coalition um, and the Ford Foundation, um, as this well as- uh, Sorry, um, I think, um, yeah. And so I'm very happy to be here for the last 10 years. I've mostly been working at the intersection between uh, gender and climate change. Um, and so that's uh, really been my focus. And at ADB, that's one of the issues that I that I cover uh, for our team. So happy to join this conversation. Thank you. Great, Zoni. What an amazing experience. Looking forward to engaging with you in just a little moment. So um, let's start with um, you, Chandani. Um, so I'd like to ask you some questions on enhancing and leveraging capacities of women and girls in all their diversity to build resilience. Um, resilience building is a collective effort, but the capacities of women and girls are often not recognized. How can we advance collaboration among multiple stakeholders to leverage these capacities uh, better for climate justice? Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Kavita. Uh, Mr. Mohamed Nasidi, Regional Director of UN Women, Your Excellency, the Minister, the Empowered Team of UN Women, where I'm a steering committee member, a fellow panelists, Madam Moderator, and distinguished participants. Good morning, good afternoon, and for some it's good evening, I believe. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be part of, I would, I would call this a celebration. We are enjoying, right? So happy Earth Day. I'm reminded of Rio in 1992, when I took three indigenous women from South Asia representing 2000 peasant women, because we had this coalition of 500 women in four countries where they shared their aspirations and demands for climate action. It was the power of the expertise 
and their rich experience they were sharing, what climate degradation affects them and how it affects their families, their communities and their livelihood in the Earth Summit in panels with lead Vangari Matai and Vandana Shiva. Despite the repeated achievements, the strategies we come up with, the mindfulness you know, that we are working to, uh, to make women's voices heard and make them more visible, still we see there's so much work to be done. And that sometimes, you know, it's very, uh, it, it disheartens me at times, you know. Moreover, any natural calamities or man-made disaster affects women most and keeps pushing them back. The, the agenda for gender equality time and again at the government level, at the national level, regional, and also at the global level, you see that. The agenda for Planet 5050 is thrown in the back seat and never prioritized enough. Our long experience shows that women most affected by disaster and climate change are in the lowest level of the pyramid. So they are unorganized and scattered. Therefore, they are invisible uh, in the national accounting system, which leads them to be invisible, more vulnerable and discriminated against. And we heard from the keynote speakers, you know, that we still do not have climate change and data, environment and data, sex desegregated data till date. Recently, Homeless South Asia had conducted a study on the impact of COVID on home-based workers in all the South countries except Afghanistan. The finding reflected that loss of livelihood, restricted mobility, rising inequalities, domestic violence, and extra unpaid care work was multiplied with the devastating climate changes. This pushed them from hunger to starvation. So organizing them in collectives and large numbers and uh, is, is a prerequisite to both human rights and climate justice. Their ca capacities have to be strengthened. We often see that a lone voice of an individual institution fall to make a mark, but when syner synergized coll collective, collectively, it, if we amplify the voices of the excluded, it becomes more powerful and effective. And uh, one year after the earthquake in Nepal, we got 100 women from all the 14 affected districts of Nepal and they had dialogues, a meaningful dialogue with the government. And they were the ones who were saying, we won't only build our uh, houses, but we'll build the country itself. So it, 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 it is very important to have collaborative uh, and strategic partnerships with like-minded institutions the key stakeholders nationally, regionally, and globally. Hello? It's okay, we can still hear you, Chandani. Globally to ensure their demands are heard and the feminist concerns are incorporated in plans and policies. Women Friendly, Friendly Disaster Management Group of Nepal is a rare example of 11 powerful CSOs coming together as a network to address key issues faced by excluded women after any disaster and to raise accountability and transparency mechanisms at all levels. In South Asia, we often see women are treated as a homogeneous group, especially during disaster. Women are all lumped up as the vulnerable group. So the resilience, capacity and leadership they show during disaster gets unrecognized and the existence is sidelined after return to normality. Therefore, the call for priority would be to build collaboratively at different levels. At country level, set up meaningful dialogues with CS CSOs to assess the need to mitigate the damages caused and the pushback factors and have sustainable uh, networks. You know, sustainable networks, not a one-time thing, but continuously, you know, you have those meaningful dialogues continuing. And it's very important to organize roundtables with PPPs, as I call it, the public-private partnership, as all are equally accountable. It's not just the government or the donors. The private sector is equally uh, important to check their accountability and to involve multi-stakeholders, donors concerned, government and agencies, the CSO, women's agencies, the affected women have to be brought to the round tables. They have to be in uh, sharing practices, you know, who will identify the key gaps and challenges 
and share their achievements. They, they did the same in Rio, they did the same in Beijing. So we have seen their power. When they are collectively together, they show it. They shake governments, you know. I have seen that happen many times. It will be equally important to engage and have regular dialogues with intergovernment bodies. Like, uh, you know, many of the problems that we have been discussing since the morning, is m many are beyond border efforts also. It's not just in-country. So uh, in, in South Asia, I would say uh, institutions like EC Mode and the SAC, you know, who are responsible institutions should be engaged. And it's not a one-time thing. Again, I would say it has to be a sustained, you know, uh, uh, I, I would call it sisterhood or brotherhood, human, humanhood, whatever you call it, but we take them together with us. Thanks, Chandani. Thank you for really giving some concrete recommendations in terms of how do we build the capacity of the women to engage more inclusively. Um, and, you know, you touched upon the, the existing inequalities and discrimination that women face. Um, and so that, that adds as a challenge. But now with the COVID-19 outbreak, you know, we, 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 we are very commonly aware that the space for civil society has shrunk quite drastically. Um, so how can different stakeholders respond to this pushback and strengthen engagement of grassroots women's and feminist NGOs in regional, intergovernmental and other formal processes? Uh, thank you, Kavita. Uh, it's not only after COVID only, only. If you really, you know, if you really look deeper, since the last two decades, we have seen and felt the vacuum of the civil society space is gradually shrinking. Whenever there is any kind of disaster, it hits women the hardest. Yet national priorities get diverted and women's issues take a backseat. In spite of the charter of demand handed to all concerned authorities by WFDM, of course, at national level and taken to Geneva, Istanbul and Mongolia too, yet women's agenda and concerns are left out and get diluted. CSOs who are the agents of change, their role and contribution gets invisible. The impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable women's groups candidly states that these marginalized women were left out from government discourse and support systems and also the social security systems. It was only the women's agencies who single-handedly did all the handholding and safeguarding uh, and safeguarding them. They sustained efforts to organize them, build their resilience, and encourage their mental well-being is noteworthy. If they were not there, uh, we don't know what, will ha what would have happened to these marginalized groups. These women's agencies, which are mostly CSOs, are the watchdogs, raising the accountability questions to the governments, commitments, and obligations. Be it CEDAW, the Beijing Platform for Action, uh, Agenda 2030, or 3020 resolution, uh, the Rio commitment, the Shendai framework, we are afraid the SDGs, which were being localized, might be sidetracked too. So we have to watch out for that too. So the call to action will be to create this space for CSOs at the national discourses and regional, uh, and regional engagements, like the different SAC forums in, in South Asia, like the, uh, the, the charter of uh, the SAC Charter is discussed again and again to update it. That is where the CSOs must come in. And the SAC Gender Database, which was dropped down, should also be picked up. The UN Women Now and the then UNIFEM's biennial events, where CSOs and governments were brought together on a regional gender platform to review the Beijing platform for uh, action, was very, very successful. And this was endorsed by head of government and head of states. So I think we need that kind of forum to bring in the, the role of CSOs and really advocate for that. And also engage uh, women's groups and CSOs in engendering the national development plan processes and the gender uh, responsive budget process that happens in our countries every year. The other discrepancy that one sees is the dirt of financial assistance and uh, the climate fund, as it was called today, the climate uh, finances, as it was called, is not only the governments who are non-engaging with CSOs, but it's the donor community 
whose funds are shrinking for CSOs too, which is unnecessary, creating uh, competition between the two. Frankly speaking, it is not only CSOs. It is the women's agency at the national level also are facing similar challenges, be it the, be it the lack of financial and human resources, be it the women's ministry, women's commissions, and even human women itself. We need these agencies who are championing our feminist agenda and are vital agents of change. So the mantra, as I would call it, is to invest, invest, and invest in women. We urgently need to build bigger, bolder, and better women's agencies at all levels. Thank you. I couldn't agree more, Chandani. The beauty of having panelists like you that can bring in so much history into these discussions and remind those of us who don't have that much experience that, in fact, at every junction, whether it be a pandemic or it be different political times, women have fought hard um, to counter the injustice and uh, discrimination that they have faced um, across the world. And it's a very important message that you've actually shared about, you know, what can we do using the Action Coalition as a platform to strengthen existing feminist movements and to build the global solidarity we need to take full these global crises of both the COVID and pandemic, um, uh, sorry, the COVID and climate crises and multiple crises of ra racial injustice and so forth that we're seeing. Um, thank you. I'll now turn to Parimita. Parimita, we know that women make up 32% of those employed in the energy sector, renewable energy sector. So what kind of concrete solutions have you come across to increase the number of women and girls in decision-making and leadership positions in the renewable energy sector? And how can these solutions be scaled up? Excellent. Thank you so much, Kavita, for putting this question, actually, which is very relevant. And again, uh, wishing all very uh, happy Earth Day and greetings <laughs> to all. Um, just before going into the depth of this uh, one, what you asked, just putting a few of the statistics in place. Yes, as correctly said, 32% uh, is the women representation in the renewable energy sector. But if you see the overall global labor force, 48% is the representation from the women's side, out of which 32% is for renewables, but overall energy sector, if you consider then it's only 20%. So only 20% of women are working in the overall energy sector, which is considered quite low. Mm -hmm. And another survey, which was of course done in 2015 uh, in 77 countries, just to find out how many ministers uh, are looking at the energy portfolio, then it's only four countries where women ministers are considered or leading the energy portfolio. That itself shows the story. So now the point is, why is that? Why in energy sector, the representation of women is comparatively low? And what can be done in order to increase or scale up those interventions further? So, and, and, the, and in order to even understand that, the point is, do we have any examples which can then say that, yes, something has been tried across the globe somewhere, and that can also be considered as an example or evidence for other regions either to customize or to replicate. So yes, I would like to take probably a few of the examples which can showcase how the interventions have been tried out or the initiatives have been taken in order to bring more women participation in energy sector. So one very good example is actually what ECOWAS Center in West Africa have done and they develop or call it mainstreaming of gender in energy access policies. So it's a regional project or initiatives by 15 West African countries being implemented by UNIDO uh, and ECOWA Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. What have they done? And what are the few findings from that? One is of course in 2015, they started implementing or developing this kind of policies. 
And from the beginning, they make sure that the ECOWAS gender department is owning this and Ministry of Energy is owning this. So it's a question of accountability. Who is accountable for this kind of policies to be executed on a long-term basis? And those kind of stakeholders needs to be involved from the very beginning. And the second one is it's not only one ministry, it's a multi-stakeholder partnership that needs to be established and they have to be involved in every stage of the uh, policy formulation. So they, they also involve Ministry of Women Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Bureau of Statistics, and several other relevant line ministries uh, for, for developing this policy. And in 2017, the policy was formulated. But the, but the most important part here is this policy is signed by the Council of Ministers and Head of State. What does it mean? It also shows the kind of political buy-in that, that have been got for this policy. So bureaucratic consent along with political buy-in is required to make some kind of changes, uh, specifically in those sectors which are so far not been very gender responsive. Um, so that's what they have done in 2017. And after that one directives have also been uh, formulated on how can they execute project by following these policies, which was also signed by the Council of Ministers. Uh, and that's how, and now of course the implementation plan, the monitoring and evaluation plan and all those things have been set after that. So this is a very good example to say how accountability has been created, how multi-stakeholders involvement has happened, and how political buy-in have been received. Just to take that example, maybe as Stanley also said that SARC, so SARC Energy Center can also be involved. We also have in ASEAN region, ASEAN Energy Ministers meeting. So maybe AEME can be involved in order to do this kind of uh, um, interventions in the region. So that's one. The second example uh, I would take is IEA, that is International Energy Agencies. Uh, the, in the IEA ministerial meeting in 2019, they have also signed one um, signatory uh, saying that um, they will basically work on gender diversity initiatives in the energy sector. And they are basically focusing on disaggregated data collection and how that data collection can, can feed into the policy formulations. So that's also another example. I would also link to all those keynote speeches which talks about lack of data. So lack of data, so, so this particular initiative is working on data and how that can feed into policy formulations. Um, and, and again, one US initiative which, which talks about clean energy uh, education and empowerment program also talks about how can we create more international ambassadors, women ambassadors as decision makers. So those are few of the examples what we can also try in our region. And the, and the last example I, I must take is our own- Arabita, sorry, we are really running short on time now. Okay. So I would like to give the floor to the other panelists and perhaps we can come back to you when we have a bit more time. But thank you so much for sharing these okay. important examples because energy democracy is a huge issue in, in, in the fight for climate justice. Um, I'll now turn to Pucci. Um, so you have a very long track record working on statistics and you chair the technical working group on disaster statistics. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say are the key challenges to mainstream gender across environment statistics, including disaster and climate change statistics? Um, and what kind of collaboration and partnerships would you, um, do you think would help us go forward? Thank you, Kavita. Um, I'll just go straight to the point. I think, um, let me start with the complication, right? First, uh, people say if you cannot count, then it really wouldn't count. Whatever imagination, goal that we have, and so if we cannot count, I'm, all the speakers say that. We want to empower women, we need to increase income and whatnot. If we cannot count, and it, at the end it doesn't count, right? But the complication is, we are counting things that are not clear, particularly in the area of environment and disaster, right? 
So we talk about what is the value of the ecosystem? What is the value of a strip of land, for example, beyond the monetary uh, value today? It's quite complicated. When we speak about disaster, how do we measure and count human risks? Right? So we have uh, vulnerability, we have capacity, we have exposure, all that. And then how do we count disaster and extreme climate events? For example, I mean, our colleague in Samoa, in Indonesia and in Bangladesh would call flood differently. When does it start? When does it end? When somebody called died because of disaster, how do you describe it? Many ministries have different numbers, right? So those are some of the complications. And then some of the leaders ask, how much money do you invest in environment and in disaster? And we cannot count that. Because very often our data is not for counting in disaster field. We have the data to mobilize resources to respond to disasters. So when the emergency is over, the data is dissipating too. And we cannot look back, we cannot infer into it, we cannot project the future. You know? So this, this is the, the, the complication. The number two complication, I think, Kavita, I think we do need a policy framework. Because the National Statistical Office, National Disaster Office, they don't usually talk. Their pieces are totally different, you know? The disaster running around responding and the statistics, you know, they're quiet and counting, they're night and day. Not to mention the other ministries and local government and NGO are not in the picture. It's only policy that can pull them together. So that's my first uh, uh, take on that. We need to work on the governance of this business so that you can produce number. Okay. Number one, uh, number two, uh, uh, number three complication is uh, it has to do with attitude. As much as we buy on women empowerment, as much as we buy into to uh, environment and all that, but when it comes, okay, now let's get to the engendered data. And people try to find the door to run out, you know. Oh, it's very difficult. We have done it already. Why do it again? In Pakistan, in Peshawar, we did the survey and suddenly, okay, if we want to put gender into it. Suddenly, the, the data would split into eight multiplication. What used to be one person now, men, women, boys and girls, right? And then it become multiplication. Those are challenges and we need to convince people the leaders, the movement people, our colleagues who have given the speech earlier, right, that we do need to move together to convince people this needs to be done. Now, the, the, the fourth one, which you already suspected, is the technicalities, all right, of how to count, what to count, not only to make it count, but to make sure that our data actually can have a conversation from the disaster and environment should be able to have conversation with education. They must be able to talk to the agriculture and using the same currency. When I'm talking about currency, it must use the same standard. We cannot talk like this and, and be fiery about it, but we cannot put the number on the table. It's useless, right? And if we have the number, they don't jive with the rest of the developmental uh, uh, framework. And then it takes a lot of fight. Now, and as uh, national statistics, disaster, Ministry of Planning, these are notorious three players who cannot sit together. So we need to work on the technicalities. Now to your question, Gavta, what is it that we need to do? First, I was advocating we need to come with policy agenda across the board on women, environment and disaster, right? Number two, we cannot stop advocating. We just have to keep talking. We have to convince the unconvinced. We have to convert to unconverted <laughs> to believe that statistics really count because otherwise you will not count, right? And the third one, of course, we need to pull our resources together to come with a technical standard. Until now, there's no single standard in the world. Indonesia is the first country that tried to, to valiantly jump into this. So myself, I formed the one disaster data in Indonesia and in, in ESCAP in Bangkok for the last seven years, we have been doing that. So the road is long, SDGs is short. 
Look, how many years in, in, uh, in front of us now? Not much, okay? So those are three things, uh, my take, and I'm, I stand to, uh, to have question answers. Thank you. Thank you, Pucci. This was really important because I think almost every speaker has highlighted how critical the data gap is and how it's really impeding the work that we're trying to do. And at the same time, the importance of it actually linking to implementation actions is what is um, where the focus needs to be. Um, finally, I will turn to um, Zoni. Zoni, the question for you is the key action area by the Action Coalition is to increase direct access to funding, financing for gender just climate solutions. How can climate finance better reach grassroots and rural levels? Uh, thank you, Kavita. That's a, that's a really uh, good question. And it's also a very complex question, I think. Um, so I think there's three things. Uh, one is that fi finance mechanisms need to be overall much more gender responsive than they already are. And I'll explain. I'll, explain um, that in a, in, a, in a bit. Then the second thing is that I think governments as part of their national processes um, need to also uh, create the, the demand for uh, gendered focused climate finance um, that also addresses the social and structural constraints that women face in, in uh, confronting climate change. And the third is that um, we absolutely need women-focused investments, particularly those at the community level that have women as key beneficiaries. We heard earlier how little uh, overall finance goes to women's organizations um, and uh, in order for them to be able to uh, respond and mobilize and engage as equal stakeholders in these national level discussions, community level discussions, international level discussions around uh, climate change, climate finance, um, we need to resource uh, women's organizations uh, to enable them to participate. So that would be, those are the sort of three things that I think we need to focus on. So on finance mechanisms, um, we have seen a, a, a great deal of progress over the years. So for example, you know, from the on outset, the Green Climate Fund was set up to be much more gender responsive than for example, the climate investment funds or the um, GEF. Um, and we've seen now, you know, for example, the climate investment funds now has uh, a gender policy, a gender action plan that is really about, uh, you know, gender transformative change. And so that is very encouraging uh, in terms of where we are um, at the policy level. Uh, the Currently there's uh, discussions on uh, Jeff replenishment, which are actually for the first time considering gender as one of sort of the key issues um, in those discussions. So I think that at the policy level, we, we have seen quite a bit of, of progress. I think where there's disconnect to some extent is sort of where, you know, these finance mechanisms rely on, on sort of what uh, governments, national governments indicate as their priorities, right? So unless they are, um, you know, uh, including uh, gender equality objectives, um, gender mainstreaming in, in their um, NDCs in their national adaptation plans and their long long term strategies, for example, um, you know, it will be uh, very difficult to really see how we can um, get the the resources to uh, the community level, particularly uh, rural women. So I think that there is some work to be done there. Um, so we've seen, you know, uh, structural changes, uh, but we now I think need to move to looking at what is the best practice for gender responsive in funding um, uh, climate change projects. Um, so, and I think that uh, there's also some effort that needs to take place. And as others have said, in collecting more data and analyzing the data and using that data to inform sort of the projects that are funded through this uh, climate finance mechanisms. And, and that, and, and there is where both qualitative and quantitative data is really critical. Um, so I think just to, to wrap up, um, you know, I think we've we have a 
a good start with the policies, but I but we also need to be bold and also challenge the, the causes that perpetrate uh, gender inequalities. Um, we have uh, very good uh, projects. Uh, for example, we did, um, uh, we, a, a few years ago, we did a, a gender assessment of uh, the ADB's uh, climate investment funds projects and how they were mainstreamed. And what we found is that we were actually doing very well in terms of gender mainstreaming, but most of the uh, most of the results that we were seeing were gender co-benefits. And that is valuable, of course, uh, but what we need is more gender transformative um, gender designs and change. Uh, and so we think that one of the, the ways to do that is through uh, women-focused investments. So we at ADB are currently looking at setting up a community resilience fund that will actually focus, uh, it will um, focus on supporting uh, uh, gender mainstream projects um, at the community level, and it would also have a dedicated gender window uh, to specifically support uh, women as direct beneficiaries. So I think it's uh, important for, for different institutions to be creative and innovative and kind of identify what is possible within their own institutions to support ways to get those climate finance resources into the hands of uh, and to directly benefit uh, women and women's organizations at the community level. So I'll stop at that, I think. Um, and it, yes, so in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zoni. What an important area for all of us to actually be informed in um, because climate finance really builds the foundation on how, how we can do the work that we're trying to do. Um, we, we are quite over time. So um, in the interest of time for the Q&A session, I would encourage the panelists to please just type in your answers um, to a number of questions that had been raised um, by our um, participants here today. Um, and the questions are directed to each one of you. So please do that. Um, and that would be really, really helpful. So we'll go straight into the Peche Kucha um, portion of our agenda. Um, this session is a celebration of our efforts for climate justice. Um, while the road to gender equality and climate action is still long, there are many groundbreaking, innovative um, in, and inspiring role models who have done incredible work in this area. And um, with this short introduction, I'll first invite Dr. Bin Bin Wang um, to please. Thank you, Kavita. Hello, my friends, colleagues, and sisters around the world. Nice to meet you to celebrate an Earth Day together. Thanks for you women inviting me to share my story with you. This is me. At the very beginning of my career, I was a journalist at China Central Television and got a opportunities to go around the whole country and interview thousands, thousands of common people. They helped me to understand this country and its reality. After the huge earthquake that hit Wenchuan in the middle of China in 2008, I joined Oxfam the International Humanitarian and Development Organization. Thus, I can go to the quick streaking area and help the poor people directly. I never thought the decision would change the tra trajectory of my life and tie my fate with climate change so closely. In late 2009, I was dispatched to the UN Climate Conference in Copenhagen, the famous COP15. With no much climate knowledge at that moment, I found myself at loss as a newcomer, just like many delegates from the same country I met inside the venue. As I observed, many parties made efforts to promote the negotiation process, but the world failed to see the results as expected. Media even blamed China as one of the countries that hindered the conference to reach an agreement. How to push China to participate in the global governance constructively? I left Copenhagen with a resolve to make a difference. My case strategy was to promote co-governance of multiple stakeholders 
to boost an open and co um, cooperative system in China's climate process. It seems that my efforts have been paid off as climate governance has gradually taken shape in China. This is an evidence. In December 2015, just after the Paris Agreement uh, approved, I was involved to a news conference organized by the State Council as a spokesperson of uh, civil society, together with delegates from government, academia, and the private sector. The news conference in such a form is the first time in the history of China. Around my 40, I got my PhD on climate change communication. As a witness and a researcher, I published my book, China's Transition on Climate Change Communication and Governance from Zero to Hero, to analyze the reason and process of China's transition from a follower to a driver. It is the first monograph of Springer Nature on Global Climate Governance written by a Chinese author. Hope is useful for you, for you all to look at China from a unique point of view. To set up connections with more colleagues and make bigger difference, I participate in Homeward Bound, one of the most influential women leader projects, and visited the Antarctica. On the same ship, there were 90 female scientists with an interdisciplinary background from more than 20 countries. After two weeks collective learning, we realized that we all care about the mother nature. We all expect solutions to address climate change. With collective wisdom and leadership, with courage and love, we can change the world. Together stronger, when women rise for all. Let's take action for a carbon neutral future. Thank you. Dr. Wang, thank you so much for your incredible journey. Um, I'll now turn to um, Ms. Pralisha Adhikari. Hello and namaste, green greetings from Nepal. Uh, this is Pralisha Adhikari and I'm, it's an honor to be a part of this event. As a young girl, I've always loved the fresh smell of soil, the trees, the plants, the flowers and the sound of the flowing river. I took this love for nature to be integrated into my academics as an agriculture student. This is a picture of my university, which is located in the outskirts of Kathmandu. And uh, this is the this is a an epitome of nature blended perfectly into the surrounding, and this is the place where I spent four beautiful years of my undergrad life. During the breaks, every time I came back to my family in the city, uh, the dusty roads, the concrete jungles, and less trees always suffocated me. My love for the capital lessened with time, and it was not a uh, it was not a permanent solution to love, to unlove your home or unlove your a city where your family lived. So, uh, how about uh, what if we were able to turn these concrete jungles into productive green spaces? What if we were able to make people realize that they can alter the microclimate around their own houses? Would they take this a step, and would they say yes to greener spaces? So we had to try our luck. This is Team Metro Khiti, which has been working for the past eight months to build greener cities by making people realize that they can produce their own food on their own underutilized spaces of their houses. And we provide them everything to grow their own food. And I'm very glad to have met these like-minded individuals who share a common love and uh, vision for greener cities. An idea that we started during the pandemic is slowly taking shape of a proper business. Till date, we have served more than 500 customers and uh, completed and installed 10 rooftop gardens in the city. So having a rooftop farm doesn't only mean fresh vegetables, but it also means that the heat above your roof is uh, less. And these vegetations, uh, they uh, filter the particulate air matter on the surroundings, which means we get more fresh air. So in this picture on the left is my mother who is uh, offering her bright smile, the brighter than the garlic cloves on her hand, which we harvested from our own farm. And on the right is our loud and proud customer who took a, who took a step forward to having a greener roof. 
and this is me. So every time I feel disconnected or lost, I get, uh, I try, I tend to get back to the nature. I jump to my rooftop farm, play with the soil and plants and no joking, but I kiss the flowers every time because without them, we'd have no bees pollinating around or no fruits and no food on our plates. So this is the high time we start creating our own green. Happy Earth Day, everyone. And thank you so much. Felicia, I wish you every success um, in your venture, and I hope to hear so much more stories from you about this. Um, good luck. Thank you. So um, I'll now turn uh, to Miss Raya Nassim from the Maldives. Hi, uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mariam Raya. I'm 23 years old, and I'm from the Maldives famously known as the sunny side of life with the beautiful sandy beaches and the deep blue sea. I'm currently working at a full-time job and I'm also volunteering at Maldives Girl Guide Association as a young reader. After attending the Helen Storer seminar by the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts in 2019, where 34 other members from all over the world took a keen interest in the environment and wanted to make a contribution to their own country. In return, we were expected to start our own project related to the environment in our own community. This is where I started working on mine called Keep the Scene Clean. The idea of this project was brought after I discussed the issues in my community with the founders of Save the Beach. Waste management and reducing plastics were the main issues that they had highlighted from many others. Try walking on the streets for five minutes. I can guarantee that you'll be able to see some trash here. The use of plastics and waste is increasing day by day. Watching waste being taken to the nearby island from the capital had me always wondering what solution we have to reduce this. I always hear reduce, reuse and recycle, but never knew how I should be doing it exactly. This helped me realize that a lot of awareness and more conversations are needed here. That just like me, a lot of others must be questioning themselves too. I started my zero waste journey when I saw a new small business in Maldives called Zero Waste MB, where I learned a lot of new things. And by a few of the Maldivian advocates who walk the talk as they create awareness through social media while doing it themselves, which motivated me to do my own about two years ago. I'm making the best use of social media to create awareness about the sustainable development goals, especially those related to the environment, about what we can do to achieve these goals individually and about the zero waste lifestyles. In addition to the social media campaign, I plan to take face-to-face -face awareness sessions, which I have taken in a youth camp organized by our association with UK youth members. And as the pandemic hit, I shifted to virtual sessions with guides from our schools and adult leaders as well, in hopes that we will become examples to the rest of the community to become more environmentally cautious. As less waste is taken into the dump, it will help to reduce the greenhouse emissions. We will be mitigating the waste being generated that would otherwise be burned down, which contributes to the global warming and climate crisis. To spread awareness and to encourage tangible actions to protect children and young people in South Asia against the impacts of climate change, UNICEF South Asia launched a regional campaign, One Planet, One Youth, One Love. Together with me, seven other young climate change champions from across the region, we will be empowering young people to raise their voices for the sustainability of their future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Raya. There is so much power in the youth movement and no wonder you're a UNICEF climate champion. Again, I wish you all the very best in your work ahead. Um, and our uh, final Pecha Kucha presenter is Ms. Zimal Umer, please. Hey everybody, my name is Zimal Umer and uh, I am the founder of Z Bags Pakistan. And I started this project back when I was eight years old. All the rubbish, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can, Zimel. So I'll start again. Hey everybody, my name is Zimel Omer and I'm the founder of the Z Bags Pakistan. I started this project back when I was eight years old. All the rubbish and pollution that we see here really used to disturb me and I remember thinking about a solution to it all night after seeing the plastic bags going away with the slightest breeze. So I came up with the idea of making newspaper bags and I ended up donating all the money that I made after selling my first batch of bags to charitable organizations. Now I have changed my bags a bit and now the material that I use is biodegradable 
and the bags are recyclable. This is the first award that I have got from as the, the Child Premier Award by Prince Abdul Aziz, which really motivated me to further work for our mother nation. Then I also got selected in the 25 under 25 Women Award by Little Lord, in which there, are, there were 25 brilliant and independent women who are serving our country. Then I was also called in a, then I also got this uh, uh, certificate by UNICEF uh, as a climate change champion. And I was really privileged to get this. I was also called in a conference by Nestle with the motto of launch our tomorrow and by our hair, I mean promoting youngsters. I was also given the title of youngest startup by Thai Startup Club. They also called me to Washington DC for a fireside chat with their founder, Sean Wood. I assume that you're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. Then I was also privileged to be a part of the eminent team of Pakistan by Akif Badri. All my journey has been like a roller coaster with wonders and joys, which has taught me many lessons that, that are going to be really helpful for me in the future. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you so much. Zimel, thank you so much. And for all your achievements, starting from such a young age, it's an inspiration to all of us. Um, so this uh, concludes our Pecha Kucha session, which I hope you've all celebrated the achievements of these amazing women doing incredible work in their countries um, for feminist climate justice. And I hope you really enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, we're now going to move into our final portion of the event, um, which will be a Slido questionnaire. So this is an opportunity for all of you attending this event today to please participate and um, put in your answers. So I believe we are sharing the Slido link um, in the chat for all of you to access. Let's see what your answers have been to the first one. Okay, so, so the most answers we've got is on building the resilience of women and girls to climate impacts, disaster, risk, loss, and damage, um, followed very now very closely by enabling women and girls to lead a just transition to a green economy. Um, thank you, everyone. So um, maybe we can roll out the next question now. Okay, so this is this is a question on how would your commitment translate to an action? Um, and here it's an open text, so please feel free to write. How would your commitment translate to action? Yes, very nice one. Be involved in the community. Improve daily consumption and reduce the use of plastic, absolutely. Active advocacy. More youth um, being linked with government policies. Great, thank you. Localizing the SDGs, advocating for systemic change. Great education for youth. What else? Can whoever's operating the Slido, um, can you share with me <laughs> the new answers coming in, please? Okay, UN program where women contribute. <laughs> contribute on the days off. Job generation, yes, for women. Mainstreaming gender and environment and climate action policies. Plant something today. I think that is brilliant. Whoever wrote that, very practical, very true. Outreach program with women workers, yes. Particularly when we're looking at just and equitable transition. Creating less garbage. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. We we will keep a record of um, your answers, which will help us develop the report that we'll prepare um, following this event. Um, OK, let's go to the third and last question for the Slido. Thank you, everyone. Um, and here we're looking for a word. So what could help you take action? Please answer in just a word. I could offer some words such as finance, capacity building, networking, knowledge. I can see we've got 108 participants. Somebody write a word in there. <laughs> Is it my end that I'm not seeing any words? Oh, here we go. Okay, great. Funding, inclusion, advocacy, policy, finance coming out hugely. Faith, I really like that. Thank you, whoever wrote that. Faith, very important. It is very hard. Um, some days, walk the talk. Excellent. Self-motivation, policy justice a great team resiliency collaboration so interesting finance finance and faith are coming quite strongly budget campaigns support thank you okay education is coming up quite strongly as well inclusion ambassadors Great, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, <laughs> really actively participating in this quick Slido, um, which provides us with, you know, quite quite a good feedback on, on what takeaways and learnings you've understood from um, what we're trying to achieve through this event in terms of understanding the Platform for Action Coalition and what we can do um, moving on from here. So now, um, we can close the Slido. Thank you so much, uh, tech team. Um, now I'd like to hand um, the floor back to Kekashan um, to conclude on, with those of us who represent organizations, how can we join the Action uh, Coalition on Feminist Action to Climate Justice? Kekashan, please. Thank you, Kavita. And let me just begin by saying that this has been such a wonderful event and what a wonderful way to begin our Earth Day celebrations. And, uh, you know, for us to overcome the odds and really change the narrative, we of course need greater participation, involvement, and engagement, and we need commitment makers, really catalysts who will motivate and mobilize more girls and women and all our diversity to join the action coalitions and take it forward, reaching out to those who are the farthest first. And our movement is based on bold transformative actions. And for these to become successful, we need that similar level of commitments. And honestly, everyone can become a commitment maker. We, and that's what we want. We have that in us. It's not only UN processes or other institutions, every individual community, social enterprise, formal and informal can and should join this movement and commit to drive this change and commitments can take on many forms support can be in the form of advocacy grassroots level actions financing policy or any other form of pragmatic commitment but the key thing is that these commitments should be measurable and ideally collaborative with other stakeholders so that overall it is game-changing transformative and intersectional the blueprint for action now is very clearly defined and uh, at the end of the day, we must continue to evaluate our progress and adapt as the need may be with our goals always in sight so that we are able to affect a paradigm shift and create a new normal where this inequality ceases to exist. So we look forward to hearing from you and working with all of you and once again, happy Earth Day.
Thank you so much, Kekashan, for that very encouraging message um, on how we can be part of this feminist action um, coalition to climate justice. Um, I note that there has been a number of commitments that were actually written in the chat window rather than through this uh, Slido. Please um, be rest assured that we are noting down the commitments that you've shared. Um, and so with this, I will now close our session and I'll do this first by thanking everyone for your excellent contribution in this event, particularly our youth champions for inspiring us um, to do so much more. Um, the organizing team will prepare a summary report and this will be shared with all of you. Thank you so much for the organizers and the tech team to make for making this event run so smoothly. Um, and with this, we will share a final video about generation equality. So let us all you know, do our best to accelerate efforts to enhance climate justice. I hope um, we get to meet each other again in June in Paris um, to, uh, to witness the amplified commitments to feminist action to climate justice. Thank you, everyone. And with this, I'll close off with the video. What defines a generation? Climate justice! Right now. Is it just about the year you were born? Or is there something more? We may have lived through different decades, different circumstances, different countries, but we all share in the global everyday push for our rights, for justice, for a world that is equal. Perhaps what defines our generation isn't our age or our background, but the line in the sand that we have drawn. We take to the streets to speak out against discrimination, and we work tirelessly behind the scenes. We stand up for peace. We are fed up with the war. And economic justice. We start with a statement and watch it become a movement. We have come a long way, but the fight isn't over, and our rights are still under assault. It is time to take action. Let us be the wake-up call the world needs. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. Be the first, the youngest, the best, and then make sure no one is left behind. When someone tries to silence you, raise up your voice. Let us wage a global struggle. Change everything or change just one thing. As long as you do something, whether you're new to changing the world or have been in the fight for a long time. Each knows exactly why we are here. We are all together, united for gender equality. And the future we create for women and girls is up to all of us.